Liz. Since, unfortunately, this spooky season is going to have to be spent inside, I thought it could be nice to get a little cozy, get some cider or some tea, and just talk about some great horror books you can read this Halloween. Cheers! Did I make an entire Halloween reading list just so I could rave about my favorite Rin Chibeko book? You betcha. This book is what introduced me to the author of the Bone Witch Saga, and it holds such a special place in my heart. Our protagonist, Okiku, is the original spooky Japanese ghost, and she's incredibly good at what she does. And by what she does, I mean executing horrible child murderers in incredibly brutal and spooky fashion. If you thought that viewing really creepy ghost murders from the point of view of the ghost would make them not very tense or, or interesting, you'd be so wrong. Rin Chupeko does an incredible job with these scenes, and they may not make up the bulk of the book, but they are far and away the star of the show as far as I'm concerned. In addition to Okiku, we have Tarquin who is a very broody teenager, covered in tattoos his mother gave him when he was a baby, and he's being haunted by an extra spooky evil ghost who hides behind a creepy blank mask. We also have Sandra, a fourth grader who can see ghosts and really doesn't understand why people are so freaked out when she talks about them. And of course, we have my favorite character, Callie, who is a sweet, precious baby angel, Tarkin's older cousin, has no clue what's going on, uh, very shocked and upset about ghosts and the fact that they exist and that she can now see them, but she's really doing her best to stand by Tarkin and be supportive of him. Their relationship really drives the story and makes it feel so engaging and sweet, even though there's all this horrible stuff going on. I highly recommend it. And if you're an audiobook sort of person, the narration for this is pretty good. I really enjoyed it myself. So if you want to find a book that's a little bit different from your traditional horror story, definitely check this one out. I have to admit, I am a major sucker for space horror. Any creepy thing becomes a million times creepier if you set it in just this huge empty vacuum with nothing, no one to help you for miles and miles and miles and miles. It is just that extra level. And The Luminous Dead really does it for me in that department. We have all of two characters in this book. We have Jair, an underqualified cave diver who's trying to make a big enough payday that she can get off her dead-end planet and go look for her mom. And we have M, who has her own array of mother issues and is sending Jire deep into this cave system with no backup other than M, who exists only as a voice in Jire's helmet for most of the book. And it leads to this really incredible dynamic where uh, Jire doesn't trust M, often is incredibly antagonistic towards her. M is just trying to get Jire there and hopefully back again in one piece and this they go back and forth between trusting each other and not trusting each other and it just adds to the sense that Jire is completely alone can only trust herself and when she starts seeing ghosts or visions or maybe the actual cave divers who came before her we have to wonder if she's really alone, or if she can trust her own perception. I highly recommend this book if you enjoy uh, lesbians, mommy issues, uh, horrible, horrible isolation in a deep, dark, claustrophobic cave, and horrible peril in, of the cave diving nature. 10 out of 10 would recommend. I have to admit, I am such a sucker for space horror. Any creepy thing becomes a million times creepier if you set it in the vacuum of space where nothing can come to your aid. And The Luminous Dead really does it for me in that department. We have all of two characters in this book. We have Jire, a pretty underqualified 
suicide cave diver who's just trying to make a big enough paycheck that she can get off planet and look for her mom. And we have M, who is Jair's employer and exists for most of the book as nothing more than a voice in Jair's helmet. M is sending Jair deep, deep, deep into this relatively unexplored cave system, completely alone, with no backup except for M, all the way out on the surface. And Jair feels off and on that she cannot trust M, and M doesn't really render herself trustworthy with her caginess and her expecting Jair to do exactly what she says and changing what Jair can see or giving her uh, adrenaline without consent. And it becomes this huge shifting relationship that leaves Jair feeling, for the most part, that the only person she can trust is herself. And when she starts seeing ghosts or possibly the actual cavers who came before her, she starts to wonder if she's really alone or if she can actually trust her own perception. 10 out of 10, would recommend. Definitely check it out if you're into lesbians, mommy issues, uh, you know, horrible isolation, uh, and the creepy, awful, claustrophobic danger that comes with exploring caves. Especially space caves where there are strange creatures that may or may not hear you and then tunnel through you and just turn you into a paste. Yeah, it is something, something else altogether. Pitch Dark may have been written with a younger audience in mind, but it is to date one of my all-time favorite sci-fi horror novels. Alongside a diverse cast of secondary characters, it features two protagonists, Laura, who is part of a family of archaeologists that go through space looking for the wreckages of old colonizing ships to try and salvage bits of history. And we have Tuck, who is a survivor aboard one such ship, who has just awoken from a 400-year cryosleep. When their ships quite literally crash into each other, Laura and Tuck have to work together to fight against creepy monsters, creepy abusers, and a terrorist organization bent on wiping out the last dregs of humanity. One of the more unsettling elements of this book is a device called a subjugator, which is installed in Laura's throat and quite literally silences her whenever she tries to sound the alarm about her ex-boyfriend's family's plot to steal power and influence from her family. And the icing on top of this horrible, horrible cake is that the subjugator responds to commands from her ex-boyfriend when he uses an anglicized version of her name, Laura. And this just adds to her sense of degradation and helplessness. And it's so satisfying to see her out with the family and the device and see how she works around it to really save the day. So check this book out if you're interested in uh, using the vehicle of science fiction to explore ideas of colonization and archaeology and history and ecological destruction and things like that. It is a really solid read and on top of being uh, really thoughtful and well, well written, it's also just incredibly enjoyable to read. It kept me on the edge of my seat the entire time. The Graveyard Apartment is one of the more literary books on this list. In true J-horror fashion, the author is more interested in creating a tense and oppressive atmosphere than in following a typical Hollywood-style horror plot arc. The story follows a young family, the father, Tepe, the mother, Misao, and their very young daughter, Tamao, as they move into their wonderful new apartment, which came at a suspiciously low price. As strange and perhaps supernatural events begin to pile up, we see that there are cracks in the family's foundation due to its tragic origin. As strange and perhaps supernatural events begin to pile up, we see that there are cracks in the family's foundation formed in its tragic beginning, and how the trauma that the characters endured 
really shapes the way that they react to signs of something going wrong. Tepe is so focused on projecting the perfect family that he will not take any clue that things are wrong and completely brushes aside Misao's worries until it's far too late. And Misao knows that something's up and that they need to get out of there, but she can't convince Tepe and she's far too devoted to playing the role of the perfect wife and mother to ever consider moving away with Tamayo against his will. And Tamayo, who is the youngest and most innocent in this family, is the one who bears the brunt of the physical and emotional trauma inflicted by the curse on their apartment. Kawike does an incredible job building a really tense and spooky atmosphere and populating it with flawed but lovable characters to explore and react to it. I would highly recommend giving this book a read, especially if you want to look smart in front of your virtual book club. The Red Tree may not be for everyone, but if you're a fan of Shirley Jackson, New England Gothic, and watching a character completely lose their shit and fall apart, you're gonna love it. The story follows Sarah Crow, a horror author of several books which never sold very well, did not gain much critical acclaim, and which she regards with absolute contempt. She rents out a Rhode Island farmhouse and moves away from her Atlanta apartment to try and finish her latest novel and recover from the suicide of her partner. But when she discovers the unfinished manuscript of the previous tenant in the basement, she sent down a path of obsession and paranoia centered around the huge red oak tree out back of the farmhouse. And when the gorgeous painter Constance moves in, things only get weirder and scarier and more bewildering. It's especially fascinating to see Sarah lose her faith in her own perception of reality which all starts when she finds a story that she clearly wrote. It's in her style, it's written on her typewriter, and is covered in corrections in her handwriting and her notation style. But she has no memory of writing the damn thing. And that story really puts the first big crack in her trust of her perceptions and her gra grasp of reality. The book is written in an epistolary style, which is not normally my cup of tea, but Kiernan does such an incredible job with it. She really understands what she's doing with the style, and it never comes across as forced or... The book is written in an epistolary style, which is not normally my cup of tea, but Kiernan does an incredible job with it. The style never seems forced, and it really captures the feeling of a journal of somebody who is having a complete mental breakdown. I am a special fan of the audible narration, which is given in a gorgeous, delicious Blanche Devereaux style southern accent, which makes the whole thing come alive. If you want a slow burn psychological horror with hints of the eldritch, then you absolutely have to read this, or listen to it in my case. I hope one or two of these books caught your interest. I thoroughly enjoyed reading them all, and I like nothing more than sharing a good book. If you do decide to read one of them, please comment down below and tell me what you thought. I always enjoy getting feedback and talking with you guys. Thank you so much for stopping by. Please let me know if there are any books you would like me to read or review in the future. I hope to see you again soon. Say bye, fans! Keep burns.